everybody. Two Alpha Gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing Alpha Gal Syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. Before we get started today, we wanted to remind you all that tick season is in full swing. So don't forget to take extra precaution when heading outside. Insect Shield provides a variety of products, including everything from repellent to gear. And right now they're offering our listeners a 15% discount with the code 2AlphaGals. That's T-W-O Alpha Gals. Visit them at insectshield.com. So I have a question for you. Yeah. How are you? Wow. I am doing really well. It's been a year almost since all of my crazy anaphylactic episodes. So that's a huge win, I feel like, for me. (laughs) Yeah, that is specifically why I wanted to ask, because here we are a year later from when you were just sort of cycling through these anaphylactic episodes. And so I thought today we could talk to our listeners about our experience with anaphylaxis with using the EpiPen and, and just what we've learned about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's so important. I mean, I know we've talked so much about this individually over the years, because now we're in year four plus of this, right? And I know for me, looking back on the severity of my reactions, I didn't realize that I was having anaphylactic reactions, not until last summer, where everything kind of spiraled starting in April, and then it just progressively got more intense into the summertime. But it is I feel like, you know, the understanding of anaphylactic reactions is so important. And it was something that I don't think I realized until last year. That's one of the biggest surprises for me as well, coming into this, not really understanding the different ways that anaphylaxis can appear. I guess maybe that's because so often in the movies, you just see, you know, swelling and hives and people grab their throat, but it's not always that. In fact, when I had been diagnosed, when I had my official diagnosis, and I spoke with the immunologist up in Charlottesville at UVA, she told me that if you have any two systems in play reacting to an allergy, that's the time that you should use your EpiPen. And that really caught me by surprise. Yeah, same for me. I mean, I didn't realize that for a very long time. I mean, looking back when I had to use my EpiPen for the very first time last April, I was told by an ER physician just that. And then looking back for years prior, I was like, oh my gosh, I should have used my EpiPen probably 10 times. (laughs) <laughs> and by the grace of God, I lived through it and it didn't progress into my throat fully closing. But I think it kept me in this really bad cycle of like my body couldn't recover fully. And I, I truly think, you know, for me, I am a bit more of a unicorn in this situation because I'm also dealing with an autoimmune thyroid disease and, you know, just kind of the complexities of all of it. But I really feel like the anaphylactic reactions kept everything tanked and my body just could not recover well. And it wasn't until I used my EpiPen that first time that I was like a light bulb went off and it's like, holy cow, I felt this relief that I had never felt before. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you experienced that when you had to use yours the first time. Yeah, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's exactly what I was thinking. I've only ever had to have one one time. Well, I that I'm aware of. There have been several other times like you where I'm pretty sure I should have used it but I didn't. But the one time that it was necessary was that story when I was on the cruise ship and the medical professionals administered it to me at that point. But I think we spend so much time worried. We worry about a reaction. We worry about using the EpiPen, what it's going to be like. And so I thought, you know, this would be a good chance for us to share our experience. And when I was administered that EpiPen from the medical professionals, I had the same experience as you. I was I immediately felt relief. That feeling of impending doom Mm. actually disappeared. I felt a little shaky afterwards, like I'd had too much Benadryl or something, but which I probably had actually at that point because I had taken it (laughs) on my own and then 
they gave me a, a whole bunch more in the medical office. But yeah, that feeling of relief. And so I want to convey that to people so that they're not fearful of using the EpiPen when it is necessary. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that was you know, you talk about the feeling of impending doom. That's definitely one of my first reactions along with it's varied from time to time. Sometimes it's been massive GI distress from diarrhea, or I've woken up out of a dead sleep to projectile vomiting. I mean, it's to be just frank, or it's the impending doom with my heart racing. And ultimately for me that I've learned with my providers is that I start to have really low blood pressure. And if I have, you know, one of those other symptoms along with my blood pressure tanking, and it happens pretty rapidly for me where I start to feel really lightheaded and like I'm going to pass out, Mm -hmm. I have to epi myself. It's the only thing to keep me from losing consciousness. And thankfully, you know, I learned that along with the guidance from ER physicians, but also my immunologist that it's not something to fear. And that was kind of what was happening to me last summer where I was having to use my EpiPen weekly because I was in some form of a mast cell storm, histamine overload, and then I would have some sort of contamination alpha gal wise, and it just tripped me over, it would do it sometimes right before I started my period. So hormones, you know, there's just so many factors, I think that can tip people's bucket over. And it's just so important to know, and we talk about this so much, what your individual body metrics are. And I do, I think it's, it's a learning process for every single person which is why we wanted to really dive a little bit deeper into this for everyone. That's an excellent point. I think one of the major influences on how I feel about my EpiPen was my experience prior to diagnosis. I think having so many medical professionals tell me over and over again that there was nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So now if I'm having a reaction, well, not so much now, but in in the past few years when I was having a reaction, I would always question myself am I really having a reaction? Is there really something wrong with me? And occasionally I sort of sink back into that because we do on occasion get exposure, even when we're being as vigilant as we try to be. And so, you know, that's something that I've got to get out of my own head on that there is a legitimate reason that I would need to treat a reaction, whether that's with, you know, my toolkit or my EpiPen. And so that makes me wonder if you should share what you do and what's in your toolkit so that you can assess your own reaction. Sure. So for me, my toolkit is made up of a blood pressure cuff that I take everywhere with me. Um, I also have my Unisom sleep melts that contain the major ingredient that's found in Benadryl, but is safe. It does not contain mammal derived ingredients. Um, I also have children's liquid generic Zyrtec that I get from Kroger. I also have a prescription for Pepsid that was prescribed to me by my immunologist. Um, And I also have liquid prednisone that was also prescribed to me. And that's kind of if I'm really in a severe situation. So those are the things that I always have with me at all times, plus my EpiPens, two of them are always in my purse. So that's kind of my toolkit. And I, for me, this is what I do and everyone is so unique. So I would, you know, definitely encourage everyone to talk to their physician about what your toolkit should look like and what maybe your steps are in, in the event of a reaction. For me, I always take Zyrtec and Pepsid together because you have two different, an H1 and an H2 blocker. So for me, it's taking the combination of those two together really helps to help the reaction kind of die down a little bit. But if it's not, if things are progressing quickly, and again, like I said, my blood pressure is my litmus test. So if, you know, if I take any of those um, antihistamines and things are not improving within a couple of minutes, then I use my EpiPen. And I will say that I have never been told by a provider at the ER, why did you use your EpiPen? But I have been asked by 
an ER physician, why did you not use your EpiPen? <laughs> <laughs> that is so important for people to know too, because there is just so much pressure around using it. Do I use it? Do I not use it? What's going to happen when I do use it? Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience when you have walked into the ER having used your EpiPen or not? You know, yeah, I don't have that experience. I've never gone to the ER for a reaction. My only emergency time was on that cruise. Every other time I've been able to contain it to this point, yeah. as far as I'm aware. Right. But can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Yeah. So some of the first experiences that I had at the ER, I had not used my EpiPen prior because again, like I said, I didn't realize I was truly in an anaphylactic state. I thought I was just having a severe reaction. And they, I was so shaky going in there. And I mean, I felt so lightheaded and it was really hard for me. You know, thankfully I had my husband, I've always had someone with me at the ER, but they administered epinephrine, you know, through an IV plus the allergy cocktail, which usually Mm -hmm. consists of Benadryl and um, prednisone. So it's usually like a steroid combination with Benadryl. And I think they also do Pepsid as well. So it's kind of all of the antihistamines combined. And I've had really positive experiences at the ER. Everyone has been very understanding and they listen to both my husband and I. Um, We tell them, you know, what I'm dealing with, what I need. I've never been met with a negative experience, thankfully. And the majority of the time has been here in our town that I've, you know, had to go to the ER. I've also had to go by ambulance. One time we live about two minutes from our EMT station. And that was the very first time that my husband had to administer the EpiPen for me. And I knew I wasn't going to make it to the hospital without passing out. So I was getting really hoarse. That's another sign for me is my voice will change. And then I'll start to kind of get that chest tightness or that pressure in my throat. But that usually comes after all of the other things. So again, the EMT on the rescue squad was like, I know what alpha gal is, you know, you're safe. And I still, you know, it's hard because you're having to turn over control to someone that you hope knows as much as you. And that was really hard for me. I mean, my husband was not in the ambulance with me. He followed us there and demanded that he go back with me when he got there to make sure that everyone was on the same page and everyone was double checking what I was given. So I just think having the plan in place prior, you know, we always talk about that. It's not if, but when a reaction Mm -hmm. occurs and being prepared. And I think had we not done a lot of this preparation ahead of time of educating ourselves, how, how are we speaking to our providers? It really helps to build confidence. And I think you need that in an emergent situation. You know, you need that kind of prior to stepping into these situations. So I've, I've never been in the situation before I had the knowledge, I guess, which I'm grateful for that. But I think that's another reason we really are hoping this is helpful for others in our situation that might be really new to alpha-gal syndrome or a, an allergy. And it's it's kind of walking that fine line of educating yourself without slipping into like the rabbit hole of fear. But, you know, last year we had gone on a road trip with our family to Colorado and all hell broke loose. I mean, it just, (laughs) it was like the perfect storm of altitude. And, you know, again, I'm one of those that is affected on the mast cell level. So I learned very quickly that there was a combination of all the things for me. It was altitude. I decided to do yoga at Red Rocks the first day we were there, which was an awesome experience, but I think my body was like, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Like, It's so hot. We were there during the heat wave. So I learned very quickly that this combination was really, really bad for me. And then I was contaminated and it just set off this cascade. So I ended up in two different ERs in Colorado. Um, I will say Colorado has a pretty amazing system because their ERs are actually set up like urgent cares. 
So they're separate from the hospital. And I was in and out of those ERs in under two hours with treatment, everything. It was really kind of a great experience. Um, That is nice. Yeah. But again, they're like, well, we don't have tick-borne diseases here. And I'm thinking, "Mm." (laughs) oh, that's a bold bold statement. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, because we went on a hike and our son had like 30 on his legs (laughs) at one point. So, you know. But they, again, I had, that was when I did have an ER physician there that was so validating. And he literally put his hand on my knee and he said, what do you need? You know, your body better than we do. What can we do for you? And I literally about fell out of that bed. (laughs) I've never had someone that was really, truly validating my experience and was so compassionate and caring. And he was the one that really talked me through being confident with using my EpiPen because I hadn't in that situation either. And he's, he was just like, why did you not use it? And I'm like, I don't know. Cause you know, I do, I think it's it's scary. Yeah. I mean, it is. I think for so many people, there's so much fear around it of what's going to happen what am I going to feel like, you know, is it, you know, I think I shared this with you. It, to me, I always felt like it was like pulling a pin out of a grenade. Right. <laughs> like I'm right. already feeling really bad. Am I, is it going to like, just throw me over the edge and things are going to go haywire. But for me, I have a very interesting experience with epinephrine where I actually get really calm it's like this wave of calm rushes over me. I don't get, I still get shaky, but I don't have this like exploding heart rate or any of that. Cause I'm already dealing with that, but it just like calms my body. And, you know, I think after really embracing that, I was like, man, I suffered for a really long time, not using it. Right. Right. And, you know, you said several things that you know, triggered other thoughts that I think are really important to share. The first being you mentioned body metrics and how you know that you're having a reaction based on your blood pressure. And that's different for everybody. I don't necessarily experience that. Mine are hives. I get hives. I get GI distress. Um, Sometimes I get my throat gets really itchy. I get that impending feeling of doom. You know, it looks so different from person to person, but once you figure out kind of what your reactions look like, that's huge. That's being prepared for when it does happen. Because like you said, you need to prepare for when, not if, because the world is not aware enough of alpha-gal syndrome to be protecting us without us asking, you know? And so the other thing I wanted to draw out was how you mentioned that you're a unicorn. And I think this is so important for people because, well, for those of you who don't know, we sort of refer to Candace as our canary because my my thought is if she can eat it, anybody can eat it. (laughs) But, you know, I think there is, again, such a range there. I don't, I don't fall in that category. I will have an occasional severe reaction, but oftentimes mine will stop at you know a rash over my chest or the GI distress. And I, and I say that, like, you think I was reacting all the time and I'm not, <laughs> we're pretty good at avoiding stuff, but it, yeah. but it does happen. You know, we are still in the tall grass with everybody else. Right. Yeah. We're definitely not like immune to these pop-up, you know, reactions, be it contamination or like I said, I think so many people have a histamine intolerance and there's so many factors that can trip you over, be it hormones, be it the environment, if it's high pollen season, or I think it's just starting to understand. One thing I really started noticing is that my really severe reactions were happening days before my menstrual cycle. So I was acutely aware of how my body was feeling those days before I would Mm -hmm. really limit high histamine foods. I would try to do things, you know, the things that I could to mitigate them from tripping like into this severe state. And that was one of the reasons that I ended up going plant-based last year because I could not get a handle on what was causing my reactions. And I think the inflama- like the inflammation that I was dealing with in my body was also triggering something more. So I, you know, I do, I think it's really just figuring out 
what is it that I need to do to get to know my body better? I would keep a food journal to start with. And it took time and it took patience. It was hard. I mean, you know, I've called you, I don't know how many times bawling my (laughs) eyes out because I was terrified. You know, it's like, is it starting again? Is it ramping up? I feel weird. I feel this way. And that can, the anxiety can make everything so much more amplified. So absolutely, you've been a huge help for me in talking through all of that and kind of helping me decipher like, okay, is this, am I just having really anxious feelings because I'm scared of this progressing? And that in and of itself, I don't know. It's been really healing for me. It's been really helpful to really build that confidence, like the confidence that I have now it came out of those situations and it's hard to go through. It's very hard to go through. It's very stressful, yeah. you know, to live in fear of these reactions and worse to live in fear of not being able to identify a reaction. And so like you mentioned, the food journal can be so critical. And not only that, but if you add these additional stressors in your life, whether it's Uh, you know, seasonal allergies or hormones. And I would add, you know, research has shown that alcohol and exercise can affect reactions. So keeping a journal that's a little bit broader, even than just food is a great tool to use to figure out what it is that triggers, what it is that aggravates your reactions and where you might be getting contamination or things that you can take out of your routine to keep yourself safe, to, to, to minimize the reaction. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I definitely am an avid walker now. (laughs) I used to be a weightlifter and I'm hoping one day I can get back to that place, but leaning into what your body needs now in this moment, I think is huge. Instead of trying to keep things the way that they were, it just might not be helpful for your reactions right now. You know, I love wine, but I'm having to really limit my alcohol consumption and I feel so much better. You know, a lot of this is such trial and error, but when you're in the spiral, what's the next baby step to hopefully spreading the time between reactions, right? Like I, in the moment of last summer, I wasn't thinking about a year from now. I was thinking about what am I going to do so that I can not have a reaction tomorrow? And then it just started to like compound. And now it's been a year and it feels really good to have this reprieve, right? And I don't know, like I could have a reaction later today, but it it's like the fear kind of gets dampened a bit. And now I feel more confident because I've there's been that time between. Sure. And in addition to the time, I would say that being prepared, you know, I feel like I go into a reaction knowing the steps I'm going to take. And that really helps with the anxiety. It helps me determine if I'm actually having a reaction or not, but being prepared is so much more than just having, you know, Benadryl or Unisom in your purse. It's having your steps in place, whether that is Benadryl to start with or liquid Zyrtec or whatever it is that works for you or the EpiPen ultimately. But in addition to just having that physical toolkit, having a support system, like you were saying, that's been huge for both of us. I've probably said this before on this podcast, but there was a time where Candace and I were on an alpha gal call with someone and I wasn't feeling good and she could see it happening as it was starting. And and then the rash broke out on my neck and she was like, I'm hanging up, I'm coming over. And she did. And she administered me Benadryl and she administered me Zyrtec and Pepsid. And I felt better, but just knowing that I had someone there who understood, who knew what my steps are, like that is a huge tool to have in your toolkit as well. We, we told tick bootcamp. It's one of my favorite things that we've said is that, you know, we're sort of each other's tick hack, you know, having somebody who knows what to do, who knows how to talk you through it 
who knows what to do if you reach the point where it does need to be treated. That is as helpful a tool as maybe yeah. you know, an EpiPen is. Yeah. I mean, I think that hands down, that is the number one. That's the number one system that I've put into place is being very transparent and open with starting with my family. Then it was, you know, you, and now it's, it just, it's made it so much easier to talk to anyone Yes. I mean, I started feeling weird in Target a couple months ago. I get this like dip out feeling. And to, again, to me, I've got multiple situations or, you know, I've got multiple <laughs> issues going on and my thyroid can make me feel like that. And I was with my daughter and I literally walked over to a Target attendant and I said, I just want you to know that I'm feeling really weird right now. <laughs> you know, I just, it's what I need to do to speak it, to help myself. And if I made her nervous, then I'm sorry, not sorry. <laughs> 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 like it just, I've gotten to a point where I know what is going to be helpful for me to calm down the anxiety portion of it. And it's speaking, yes. it's yes. speaking yeah. for what I need talking through it. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think about people who don't necessarily have a support system out there right. either. And that's one thing we want, we want to alpha gals to be, you know, helping connect those of us out here living with alpha gal syndrome to, to navigate living with alpha gal syndrome. And um, one of the other things that gives me peace of mind that might offer some peace of mind to people who don't necessarily have a spouse or a neighbor who is familiar with this is we ordered um, you know, road ID bands. Mm -hmm. So I have a band that I wear when I'm out. Um, or if, you know, if I'm not with my husband or my kids know what to do now, um, they're older, but, um, it's a band that says, you know, my name, my, in case of emergency contact that I have alpha gal syndrome and that I am allergic to all mammal products and byproducts. And so I know if I were on my own and God forbid I was in a car accident or something in the emergency care, that at least that would be sort of a first level information for the medical staff to know. Yeah, that's a great point. Will everyone know what alpha gal syndrome is? No, we've experienced that. But something uplifting is that to me, and I would be curious if this was your observation as well, more and more and more people are aware of it. Now, you know, I had to go to urgent care kind of recently for a non alpha gal related issue and the nurse there and the doctor there both knew about alpha gal syndrome. And, and that was not the case four years ago. So it seems like the word is getting out. So take that to heart as you're listening to us, that the work that everyone is doing, Dr. Commons, Dr. McGill, alpha gal information, you know, the work that everyone is doing is working. Yeah. So I completely I that, that's agree. To mention too. Yeah. It is absolutely. And, you know, we just really hope that sharing our experiences will bring you some comfort and also power you to be your own advocate. So do not be scared to find a support system, ask for what you need, and don't be scared to use your EpiPen. Um, <laughs> this might be a good, it might be a good short little video clip that we should do, Debbie, like demonstrating how to use your EpiPen properly. I think um, that's a great idea. Then maybe we'll do that and put that up on our social media soon. Um, the gals go rogue. <laughs> <laughs> we will not really use our EpiPen. We'll no. Just say yeah no. It. <laughs> but it, um, I think that, that, you know, is important to repeat that it's not, it's not as, as you described the first time that your husband had to use it on you, you know, where he, you know, drew his hand up and like jabbed you in the leg with oh all his force. Gosh. It does not have to be that. And honestly, whenever you tell that story, I always picture Nicolas Cage at the end of the rock, you know, standing there <laughs> <laughs> on top of the, um, the prison, you know, having had this exposure and he's got to jab that giant needle into his heart. <laughs> That is not how you use your EpiPen. It no. is not pulling the pin on a grenade. It is not jamming it into your heart or your leg or anywhere. It's actually a pretty, pretty easy. It's very easy. Process. It's yeah. very gentle. It does not hurt. If it hurts, you're being too forceful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so don't be like Lee. Don't give your partner or wife or husband or whoever a contusion in their thigh because it is not <laughs> necessary. <laughs> I had a contusion for like a month after that. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we always say, don't live in fear, live aware and everything will be okay. Yes. So I think the takeaway 
from our conversation today is that, you know, you need to learn your body, know your body metrics, know your body, set up a toolkit, know what you need to do and in what order when you start having a reaction, find some sort of support system, whether that's a partner or a neighbor or a friend or the community online. And don't forget to talk to your medical professional. Because as a patient with a diagnosis, you are entitled to receive good medical care. And a medical professional should be willing to lay out with you what you need in your toolkit and the steps you need to take should you start having a reaction. And if your medical professional won't, find a new one. That's right. Tell them to Alpha Gal sent you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until next time. Thank you for joining us today on In the Tall Grass. Visit us at 2alphagals.com, that's T-W-O alphagals.com, or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at 2alphagals. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Ticks suck, but life doesn't have to. 